Hello, explorers. Welcome to True Crime and Uno. This is true crime video number two. And today we have John List. So uh, let me get started here. Let me rewind this. We've got $50. That is $25 from Weekly Uno that I cashed off. The other $25, $10 of it was from Receipt Jar. $15 was from Swagbucks. So now that that's done and out of the way, let's get started. So John Liz was born in Bay City, Michigan um, to a dad who was a devout Lutheran and Sunday school teacher. In 1943, John enlisted in the U.S. Army and served as a laboratory technician for World War II. If you guys hear my kids, they're getting ready to go outside. Um... In 1946, John was discharged from the Army after doing a full tour, and he enrolled in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, he, from the University of Michigan, he got his bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's in accounting. Sorry, I'm trying to get into the swing of it. It takes me a little bit. So, um, in November of 1950, the Korean War was um, kind of escalating, and so he was called back to active military service again, and he was stationed in Virginia. So, while stationed in Virginia, he meets Helen Morris Taylor. Helen had a daughter already from a previous marriage, Brenda. So, Helen and John end up getting married in on December 1st. 1951 but in baltimore maryland soon after they got married they moved to northern california as a family one thing you'll notice is that john and his family move a lot i don't know if i'm envious or because i really like moving but um it's a little more than even i could handle so they moved to Northern California, and in 1952, he completes his second tour in the Army and then goes on to work for a paper company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So he's moving again. Once they're in Kalamazoo, he kind of settles down and starts a family with Helen, and they go on to have three more kids aside from Brenda, who she has from her previous marriage. Um, 1959 their marriage starts to decline and Helen is noted to be an alcoholic um she's unstable she's angry she's jealous and she's taking all of this out on John or so it's said so in 1960 Brenda which was Helen's daughter from her previous marriage gets married and leaves the family house and so after this, the entire, the rest of the family, um, John, Helen, and the, their three kids leave Kalamazoo, Michigan and move to Rochester, New York. I'm probably messing this up, but whatever. Um, where John gets a job at Xerox. So he's got really good jobs. Um, for somebody who moves as much as he's moving, he's able to use utilize his um, his degrees, his masters, and everything, and he's getting really good paying jobs. Um, but in 1965, he decides to move again, and this time they move to Jersey City, where he gets a job in a bank. This time, when they move, John's mom moves in with them. And they purchase a 19-room Victorian mansion called Breeze Knoll. So, just crazy. Did I even... Put, I didn't put one in car insurance. I see that now. Um, co-workers um, from job John's job at the bank went on to say that, you know, they... John wasn't really a social person. He was described as cold. He had no friends. He had no social skills. Um, but they were obviously very envious of his life, um, of his beautiful home. He seemed to have the perfect home life, marriage, kids, everything. Um, but as a person overall, he had no friends. 
And so his lack of social skills was actually causing him to lose jobs. So the reason they were moving so much wasn't because he was getting offered all of these new jobs and, you know, it wasn't this glamorous life. It was actually um, a direct cause of him losing the jobs. So he'd get these really good jobs. Sometimes he would even get promoted. But because he was unable to talk to people, um, he was actually getting fired. He was He was losing his jobs altogether. So at some point, John ends up losing his job at the bank in Jersey City, but he simply can't tell his family this. I mean, how could he be honest? So instead, he leaves every single day, like clockwork, goes to the train station, and then just sits at the train station all day reading a newspaper until it's time to go home. So his family had no idea that he had lost his job and this was just hanging out at a train station every day. He's trying to keep up this facade. Um, he did it for a while, but the stress was starting to build up from the lies. Um, he was drowning in the bills. The mortgage was past due. Uh, things were just becoming increasingly too difficult to keep up these lies. And so eventually he gets noticed that the foreclosure process has begun on his home because the mortgage is that far behind. So at this point, he knows his charade is up and these months of lies and deceit were about to be exposed and he hit, and he would be seen as a failure. And that just simply wasn't acceptable to him. Um, it wasn't an option. So rather than let that happen, he came up with a new plan. And this new plan would start November 9th of 1971. His kids went to school. Helen was in the breakfast room. If you remember, this house has 19 rooms. So Helen is in the breakfast room drinking her coffee and John comes up behind her and ends her life via um, gunshot wound to the back of the head. After confirming that she was gone, uh, he went upstairs to his mother's room. So his mom had kind of the attic. She had the very top room. Uh, she had kind of a whole area upstairs. Um, so he went up to her room and he shoots her above her left eye. By this time, it's afternoon and his daughter, Patricia, who's 16, and his son, Frederick, who's 12, are coming home. John ends up shooting both of his kids in the back of the head. Because this is such a much more sensical thing to do than... Um, just confess that you're, you've fallen on hard times, obviously. Any rational person would make these same choices. So after this, he goes into the kitchen and makes himself lunch because obviously it's lunchtime and what else are you going to do? I mean, keep in mind the entire family is still in the house, unalived. Um, so after this, he then goes to the bank and he closes his personal accounts, he closes his mother's account, and he goes into his mother's savings account and drains it. He then goes to Westfield High School and watches his oldest son, John Jr., who's 15, play in a soccer game. Um, after the soccer game, he drives John home, John Jr., waits for him to walk into the house and then shoots him in the chest and the face multiple times. John later said that he shot him so many times because he was trying to resist and run away. Just absolutely horrifying, like horrible person. Um, so after this, he has now taken out his entire family, all three of his kids, his mother and his wife. He then calls his kids school and tells them that they're going to be away for a while and so that they won't worry. And in my opinion, he's doing this in order to, um, so that they won't, there won't be a welfare check. Uh, if your kids don't go to school for a period of time, they're going to, there's going to be a welfare check eventually. And that would, by them not checking, nobody really checking in on them. That's going to give him time to get away. And so that's pretty much exactly what he did. So... If you remember, John was a very religious person. Um, he was Lutheran. He was a Sunday school teacher. 
Um, and so after he does all of this, he sits down and he writes a five page letter to his pastor that was later found in the, on the desk in his study, um, which was ultimately a confession. However, in his confession, he gives his reason why he does this. And he said he was attempting to save his family's souls because it was the 1970s and he believed it was a very sinful time. And he believed his family was giving into this temptation. Um, that his daughter Patricia had come to him and his wife Helen and expressed that she wanted to be an actress. And he viewed this career as corrupt and linked to Satan. So John then puts his wife and his daughter's body in sleeping bags and moves them to the ballroom in the mansion. He did, however, leave his mom up in the attic. Apparently it was just too difficult trying to get her downstairs. So he left her up in the attic and then he went to bed. So the next day he decides, you know what? The next thing I need to do in order to prepare to, um, Oh, that should have went into internet. And then that one should have went into water. Um, the next day, he decides he has one more thing he needs to do in order to prepare his escape plan and avoid being caught. And this is to cut his picture out of all family portraits in the house. So he went through all of the albums, all of the photos on the wall, every single photo in the mansion, and he cut himself out. And by doing this, this was the 1970s, early 1970s, um, there would be no photo to reference once the police finally did come to the house to discover the bodies. They would have no idea what he looked like because there's really no digital footprint anywhere. Um, and so that's what he did. He took the time to cut his picture himself out of every single picture. Um, he then turned the thermostat down to preserve the bodies so that he could prevent the smell of decaying bodies, um, which would just, you know, obviously if there's a rancid smell coming from this mansion. Eventually somebody's going to notice and that's just going to be one more reason for there to be a welfare check. Uh, he also turned up the radio and he took off. But before doing that, he also sent letters to the schools, um, letting the schools know that the kids were and him, the family was going to be visiting Helen's mom in North Carolina for several weeks and that the kids wouldn't be at school. And he stopped mail delivery, newspaper delivery, and milk delivery. So at this point, there's no reason for anybody to be coming to the house. So this will just give him even further of a head start to take off. And so eventually, um, the neighbors start to notice that the lights in the house never shut off. They are on 24-7 and so has this music. It took about a month, but eventually the lights started to burn out. They noticed the lights were burning out one by one and that they weren't being replaced. They weren't being turned back on. The ones that were on weren't being turned off. There was no movement in the house. And so one of the neighbors um, calls the police. And so the police show up and they knock, knock, knock on the door. There's no answer. So they start looking through the windows and they see the bodies laying in the ballroom um, through the windows. It did take them a while to find Alma, the mom, up in the attic, but they eventually did find her. So then they start this investigation, and there were hundreds of leads, um, but all of them were unsuccessful. Later, they found his car, the family car, at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. So they started checking um, flights and... They checked to see if he had gotten any tickets, like had purchased any flights or boarded any flights or anything like that. And he hadn't. So once again, they were at a dead end. Oh, I just put those in the wrong spot. One, two, three, four. Those need to go back here. It took 18 years for John to actually be captured. So the last $2 are going into and the energy. So it took 18 years for John to eventually be captured. Um, and according to John, here's how that happened. He left his car at the airport, traveled by train and bus from New Jersey to Michigan, 
and then from Michigan to Colorado. In 1972, he settled in Denver, Colorado and got a job as an accountant under the name Robert Peter Clark. He had a classmate with the name Bob Clark. And so that's where he said he took the name from uh, because if you, you know, if they had went and looked for anything under Bob Clark, that was a legitimate person who had accounting because, you know, they went to school together. Um, he said Bob was one of his friends and that's where he got the idea. They later interviewed the real Bob Clark and he said he had no idea who John List was. Um, while in Denver, he joined a Lutheran congregation and ran a carpool for church members. At one of the church gatherings, he met Dolores Miller. They married in 1985. And in 1988, they moved to Midlothian, Virginia. Once again, he's back to his moving. So in Virginia, he is once again working as an accountant. And in 1989... America's Most Wanted features John List and the Killings. And this was in May of 1989. Um, at the time, this was the oldest case that America's Most Wanted had ever aired. And there was literally no, um, there was no leads. They didn't even have a photo to be able to say, you know, this is who we're looking for. So what they did was they had Frank Bender, who was a forensic sculptor, a very successful forensic sculptor, create a head and bust to show what John probably looked like. In order to do this, Frank Bender consulted with a forensic psychologist to um, get an idea of what John was probably, what was he was like. And one of those things was that the forensic psychologist said he probably wears glasses um, in order to appear more important than he was. And sure enough, he did. So when this aired, a Denver, Colorado couple is watching it and says, that looks like our old neighbor, John. Actually, I think they, they knew him as Bob. Um, but they said, that looks like our old neighbor. And so they call and they give the tip and it led to arrest, an arrest. Um, when he was arrested, he was wearing the exact style of glasses as they had put on him in the sculpture. It's kind of crazy if you see the picture of him at his time of arrest and a side by side of the sculpture, it, they're identical. Absolutely crazy. So on June 1st, 1989, um, he was arrested at Richmond accounting firm. And for a solid month, he insisted that they had the wrong guy, but they presented him with evidence um, and that evidence was his fingerprint match from his military records. Uh, so his fingerprints matched John List's fingerprints from the military records. And then all of those fingerprints matched the fingerprints within the mansion and at the scene of the crimes. And so February 16th of 1990 was the first time that he confessed to his true identity. And he testified at trial that he was faced with financial difficulties in 1971 after losing his job. So he spent every day at the train station. Um, and he basically blamed all of this on his wife, Helen. He said that her alcoholism and her untreated syphilis transformed her from an attractive young woman to an unkept paranoid shut in. And that she would belittle him publicly saying that his sex performance was awful compared to her first husband. And, um, so all of that, all of the abuse and whatnot from her alongside the financial stress that he was dealing with was just too much and he couldn't deal with the stress. He also said that he killed them to spare them the humiliation of losing their home and hoped that they would go to heaven. It was stated that he never showed remorse. He never cried. He never um, said he was sorry. Nothing. Uh, later, he was diagnosed as... Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which they said caused him to consider only two solutions. One, accept welfare and handouts or two, kill his family. There, there was no, nothing in between. Those were the two options. And so October 12th of 1990, he was convicted on five counts of first degree murder. And at sentencing, he denied all responsibility. He said in quotations, I feel that because of my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. I ask all affected for their forgiveness, understanding, and prayer. 
The judge was not moved by this in any way. And so the judge imposed five life sentences to be served consecutively, which at the time was the max penalty. In 2002, he did an interview with Connie Chung and he was asked why he didn't end his own life. He stated it would, he didn't do it because it would forbid him from entrance into heaven where he hoped to reunite with his family one day. Newsflash, Johnny Boy, um, I'm pretty sure that murder is going to be why <laughs> you are not granted entrance into heaven. Um, I don't know, just guessing here. So, um, fortunately, March 21st, 2008, he died of complications due to pneumonia at the age of 82 in prison. And the Victorian mansion known as Breeze Knoll was destroyed by arson on August 20th, 1972, 10 months after the murders. Um, that's really all the information they give on that. But honestly, it's good because that's... I can't imagine wanting to live there. In 1974, a new house was built on the site. But like, I don't know that I would want to live there either. I don't know. So that is the story of John List and how rather than just admitting that he lost his job, it was much more sensical to take out his whole family. So yeah. All right. Um, let's now... Add this up. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dollars going into mortgage. So now in mortgage, we have five, six, seven, eight, nine. 9, 20, 30, 5, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. So $950. So close to 1000 And I do have the placeholders um, in case any of these hit 100 so that I can put that into the um, high yield savings account. So going into car payment, we've got $3.00. Car payment now has 220, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Not enough to color one in on there. $226. That's that's uh, almost half of my car payment. We've got $3 going into NV Energy. So now NV Energy has 205, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. $211, which means that I get to color in one icon for NV Energy. This means we are $9 away from completing NV Energy. That's crazy. And I have pen all over my hand from writing my notes for this case. <laughs> I've tried to wash it off and it just will not come off. So you've got $3 going into AT&T. So now there's 23 in here. We do not get to color one in on here. There's $3 going into HOA. So now HOA has 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. I don't know if that's... So we do get to color one in on HOA. Should probably just pull this down, make it easier. So if, let me know if you guys were aware of this case. Um, and then if you want, go ahead and leave in the comments um, what I should, maybe if there's any cases that you want me to talk about. So we have one, two, three, four, five going into progressive. So Progressive now has 26. So we do get to color one in on here too. I delayed this video because of how, <laughs> because I needed to like prepare everything for the, um, the true, the true crime story. Um, I just had so many other things that I just made this the last thing I did. Uh, so $1 going into Cox. I need to clear this off. 
We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six dollars going into water. Again, I need to clear this one off. Um, I'm sure I made mistakes during this video. I know they were, po they were, um, several people commented about the mistakes I made in the last one, like as far as cash stuffing. The thing is, I'm not really concerned about it when it comes to this because at the end of the day, it's all going into the same um, account and it's all going to the, towards the same thing. So if they're in the wrong envelopes, it's not that big of a deal. So we have one, two, three, four, five dollars going into gas. So in gas, let me see. I'm sorry. So we have 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we should have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. There is a lot going into water this week. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dollars going into water. Um, not water, internet. Eight dollars going into. What am I looking at? There's eight dollars going into trash. <laughs> Twenty, forty, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Hi, you guys. 20, 41, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 51, 2. So $52, that completes this tracker, which means this money is actually going to go back into mortgage. And here's the exciting part. Um, mortgage only needed $50 to reach 100, I believe. Let's just count this. Let's put all the cash in there and then count it. So... There's 20, 40, 60, 70, 5, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. So we're going to take this $100 that will go into the high yield savings. And so by the time you guys see this video, I will have done that and I will put that in. I will put a screenshot up like I did last time. So now in here, we've got five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's a thousand. So we are going to swap that out for a one thousand dollar placeholder. We are going to color in. We have officially reached one thousand dollars in this envelope. So one thousand and two dollars. And we're going to be adding another $100 into the high yield savings account. So that is all that I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, like I said, let me know if you've ever heard of this case before. I had not prior to this. I feel like there's a lot of um, like crime dramas that are loosely based off of this case after reading it. Um, but yeah, let me know. So. I will see you guys back here for the next video. So until next time, bye.